Welcome to the Screen the Screener College Basketball Podcast with your hosts, Mike Randall and Gus Kearns. Welcome in listeners to the Screen the Screener College Basketball Podcast. We're always talking everything college hoops. You could have been anywhere else on the dial, but you chose to be here with us. Mike and Gus, and we appreciate that. Just trying to fill your sports void for you. Trying to give you your fix. Hope we're helping out in some small way. Hope everybody's calm, healthy, and safe out there. Thinking of you guys, the listeners, and hopefully we're keeping you company on something that may be an easy task, or maybe it's a little something tougher. We'll do that with some college hoops talk. Sound good? With our season recap series, we've talked to a number of smart, devoted, plugged-in individuals, and this episode is no exception. We've brought in Alex Zetlow the sports editor over at the Rock Hill Herald, and he covers Winthrop hoops. That's right. We're going to talk some Winthrop Eagles and some Big South. A couple things that we got to talk about with Alex include, this is one of the teams that got to cut down a net and celebrate a championship and had a March invite. We talked about Coach Kelsey's coaching pathway and exactly who his idols are and who he's been influenced by. We talked about the diversity on this roster that will exist next season, discussed the Winthrop style of play and why they would have given any top seed in March that they were matched up against in the bracket. A little bit of a scuffle. And then we also talked about what might be coming up in the future for the Winthrop Eagles. Alex was nice enough to give a scouting report on a couple of Big South players like Carly Jones, Shibuti Phillips, Jose Perez. If you like what you're listening to here on the Screen the Screener College Basketball Podcast, please don't forget to give us a follow on Twitter, SDS Podcast. Efficiency of keystrokes, of course. Please give Mike a follow over on his end. He is a little bit knee deep in the NFL draft this weekend. So we're going to take the reins for a podcast or two, and then we'll hook up after the he comes out of the NFL fog, the NFL draft fog. Please give him a follow over at Randall Rant. He does great things. He's entertaining, insightful, and educational. And if you really like what you're listening to, please don't forget to give the podcast a kind review on your podcast consumption vehicle of choice. Kindness is always cool out there, listeners. Let's get to that conversation with Alex about the Winthrop Eagles. And again, you can give Alex a follow at A-L-E-X-Z-I-E-T-L-O-W-0-5 on Twitter. He does a great job covering the Winthrop Eagles for the Rock Hill Herald. Welcome in listeners to the Screen the Screener College Basketball Podcast, where we're always talking everything college hoops, even though there's not any college hoops to consume currently viewing wise. So hopefully we're helping out listening wise. We try to talk about a number of different teams that had meaningful, powerful seasons this past college basketball season. And one of those teams was the Winthrop Eagles from the Big South. And we've brought in Alex Zetlow to help us out from the Rock Hill Herald. Alex, thanks for giving the podcast a little time and talking a little Big South and Winthrop Hoops. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, how's everything going out there? Are you holding up all right? Is there, uh, how, how, how is your situation in the current climate that we're living in right now? Are you holding up all right? Oh, yeah. I'm holding up well. Uh, a big part of my job is actually on top of reporting on Winthrop Athletics and reporting on high school athletics. Obviously, coronavirus has kind of subdued that for now. Helping out a little bit on the news side, um, becoming a more well-rounded reporter, which is, it, it, that's how I choose to look at it, at least. I'm a big-time sports fan, so I'm bummed about the sports season, but you got to make what you got to make of it. You know what I'm saying? That's been a familiar theme and a familiar sentiment of a lot of the guests that we've had on, Alex, is just like they're bumming right. about not having sports available to consume. So we're hoping that this helps in some small way. Even though March has passed, March was a thing and it, it existed for the Winthrop Eagles. Alex, you're one of the few teams that had one of those magical spots locked up for the big dance with a huge second half comeback in the Big South Championship against Hampton and their straight up stud, Jeremy Mar- Moreau. Let's start there. What was the vibe after securing a March invite after that big second half comeback in the Big South tournament? Well, it was kind of how you'd imagine a mid-major championship celebration to be. There was, the court was stormed, players wore their championship hats, the nuts were cut down. Winthrop has a long history in making the NCAA tournament, stemming back to Greg Marshall's decade-long te- tenure just a few years ago, but Winthrop hadn't made the NCAA tournament since 2017, which I know doesn't sound long, but it is long considering Winthrop's rich basketball history. Yeah, I mean, like, that was kind of the vibe. It was kind of like, yes, we made it. Like, this is the ultimate prize for mid-major schools like Winthrop. Talked to a couple of the seniors on the court, you know, like, in the moment, in the elation, they were super excited to play in front of 
the millions of spectators, whether that be the spectators watching TV television in the actual arenas. I mean, this like beautiful culminating moment. It was great. And unfortunately it was short lived, obviously, but for that moment, right. like the length of season was exactly what they wanted it to be. And one of those seniors that you talked about that you probably, you know, traded words with and got, an, you know, a ex- very excited expression from was Josh Ferguson. He was your rock for four years. How much Coach Kelsey and the entire Winthrop program leaned hard on him during his stellar four-year career as an Eagle, especially down the stretch this season when he averaged over 16 points a game over his final seven games for the Eagles. Josh was exactly that sort of guy for the Winthrop basketball program. It's, it's funny. Every time you talk to Coach Kelsey, and I, I hope we get to talk about Coach Kelsey's personality at some point in this discussion but um one of the (laughs) one of the first times i talked about or i talked to coach kelsey about how the season's looking you know just like kind of getting a general feel of the of the state of the program going into it he did not stop talking about josh ferguson he saw he always says buy stock in Josh Ferguson's future because that's like kind of how he is. Josh is this long, lanky. He shot a a, a lot of threes, but he was a forward. He was the team's leading rebounder. From what I could tell, just like sitting in on practice and stuff, he was a huge vocal leader for the team as well. So he was definitely one of the people I talked to on the court after after the championship game. Another thing that I talked to on the court after the championship game was Hunter Hale. He was he was not a senior, but this was his last year playing at Winthrop. His last and only year, actually. He was a graduate transfer, came from the D2 rank. His, and him coming on at the end of the season was, was phenomenal to watch. Kind of to kind of punctuate the, the season for Winthrop. I, I wrote a story about, you know, Hunter's journey to Winthrop, and ultimately he had one chance to start and make an impact on a Division One team. And he had one chance to make the NCAA tournament, and he did that. Unfortunately, he didn't get to live out his dream at the NCAA tournament. But not many people can like win their final game of college basketball, and that's something that Josh and Hunter did, and they each have kind of interesting journeys there to that point. Yeah. So again, that moment of winning that championship was quite special for both of them. Our audience and the listeners and, and sports fans out there are longing for sports to exist. The stopping point and the finish, the finish line that existed for the you know current reasons did provide an interesting end to certain careers, like you mentioned with Ferguson and I guess with Hale as well, where they actually get to end their college careers with a win and a championship, which is kind of unique. Hunter was amazing in the semifinal game. He went off for 28 and was a big reason why Winthrop was playing in that championship game against Hunt, against Hampton. So he, he definitely made the most of his opportunity, no doubt. Speaking of Coach Kelsey, Alex, he had some huge shoes to fill after, after the great Greg Marshall, which you alluded to earlier. Well, I guess a couple of questions here about Coach Kelsey. Give us some background. Why did Coach Kel- Kelsey stay? back out of the UMass job to remain at Winthrop. What what made him change his mind and come back home, so to speak? My predecessor, so I, this is my first year covering Winthrop Athletics. Um, my predecessor, uh, Brett McCormick, was, I, I talked to him about this moment like often because it's unique. It's, it's rare for a coach like Coach Kelsey. He, he said, for those who don't know, in 2017, Pat Kelsey had been with Winthrop as the head men, men's head basketball coach for five, six, six years or so. It was in 2017. He signed a memorandum of understanding with UMass. And, right. and essentially that memorandum said, we are going to work towards signing a contract and being our next coach. And when I say it out loud now, that doesn't sound as binding. It, it wasn't binding legally, but every stone from every invitation this it was a binding thing. I mean, they got the UMass had the band in the gymnasium. They had yep. the, the, the press conference was completely ready, and, and so on and so on. And at the same that day, Coach Kelsey called the athletic director and ultimately returned to Winthrop. In the reporting from my predecessor, Coach Kelsey was just like coming back to Rock Hill. To Winthrop is 
the best for my family, as unsatisfying as that might be to the UMass faithful that was really excited about having Coach Kelsey. I think that this, I think that that is kind of true. I mean, Coach Kelsey loves the Rock Hill community. He, his kids are in are at St. Anne's, which is the Rock Hill Catholic school. I mean, it, it, he is definitely ingrained in the Rock Hill community. And so I, he did what he wanted to do for his family. And I think that is really as far as we know for why he backed out of the UMass job. Since right. the UMass job, he's been at Winthrop and talked to him for several weeks before knowing about the UMass situation. So it, it, it is behind him from, from what I could tell. There's something to be said for knowing what you want. And knowing that you have a recipe for success, when you frame it that way, Alex, it, it makes me reflect back upon, you know, why Mark Few hasn't left Gonzaga, you know, why Coach Becker remains at Vermont, you know, certain situations that parallel uh, the situation at Winthrop. Maybe Coach Kelsey knew that that was something he didn't want to mess with. He could go get a bigger job, a higher profile, bigger conference, what, you know, whatever terminology you want to put on it. But really, once you reflect back upon it, if Family's happy. You have success. Your student athletes and, and, and your university are buying into the program. What else do you want? So let, let's go into some of the coaching characteristics. Alex, give us one or two distinctive characteristics that Coach Kelsey owns that allows success, even you know during a season like this past season, when you're not the overwhelming preseason favorite in the conference, yet garner that March invite with a huge win in the conference tournament finals. Absolutely. Um, One thing, kind of going back to what you were saying earlier about certain coaches, like knowing what they want and not wanting to leave, obviously the Brad Stevensons and the Shaka Smarts have said, hey, I know the grass is green on my side. But it's also interesting, Greg Marshall, Pat Kelsey, obviously someone that Pat Kelsey admires going into, or who was at the Winter Pelham for so long and brought it national prominence. He actually was in a similar situation with, with Pat Kelsey where he planned and ha- there was a huge press conference for him to leave Winthrop and he ultimately came back as well. So w- when you're talking about the parallels, I think that's interesting too, uh, between huh. th- that parallel between Greg Marshall and Pat Kelsey. But yeah, so, so talking about Pat Kelsey's personality, he is loud. He is enthusiastic. You will not see him sitting down in a game. He played under and coached under his mentor, his the, the ultimate mentor for him, Skip Prosser, who was a coach at Xavier and a coach at Wake Forest. He adores Skip Prosser. He quotes him at least once a day. He starts a lot many of his sentences with Coach Prosser saving Coach Prosser to say that. Coach Prosser also said a lot of things about Coach Kelsey himself. Coach Kelsey says Coach Prosser used to call him the guy who makes coffee nervous. And I think I I think that is kind of how most people view Coach Kelsey, just like this guy who's got so much energy. But it's also important to note that he is like overwhelmingly, he overwhelmingly admires Skip Prosser, his Wake Forest favorite coaching days, which is, which is pretty cool. Definitely. If you're going to have two major influences on your coaching path, if we're going to talk Coach Marshall, who's now, you know, obviously taking Wichita State to a Final Four and number one seed. During Mark Madness and Skip Prosser, who is one of the finest coaches, like you mentioned for Xavier Wake Forest, uh, that left us way too early. I think you're following the right path. I think Co- I think Coach Kelsey's got something cooking over there. Let's talk, let's talk some players. Explain to the okay. listeners just how unique your point forward slash guard Chandler Valdron is. He's six seven, posted a triple double this season. He led the team in right. minutes, defend multiple positions. I feel like he's got a little Sabrina Onescu feel to his game. How special is Valdron and, and, and who will have more triple doubles next year? He or Belmont's Grayson Murphy? What do you think? <laughs> well, firstly, I bet Chandler Valdron would be super honored for being in the conversation between those two great athletes. But yeah, you're right. Chandler Valdron just like is a stat sheet stuffer. Actually, while he was at his D2 two years ago, his Division II school team that he played for, he actually led the nation among all divisions in triple doubles, which, which is quite cool. Chandler Vaud- firstly, Chandler Vaudrin, six seven, lefty. His size shows. I mean, he can look over defenders and 
pick and roll situations. He can actually post up a lot, which is something that you don't see guards do often in the Big South, but he has the ability to do that. So the thing about Chandler is really quite striking is for a while there, Chandler and this other guy named Russell Jones Jr. started and they were both, they both kind of handled point guard responsibility. Chandler is six seven, and Russell Jones is five seven, and it was it was really cool to it was really quite cool to see. I mean, you can't really that's the most that's the most unique backcourt the country I would say in terms of like size or whatever. And obviously, their size blends them different styles of play. That was really that was really cool. That was really cool to see Chandler Bogdan. He is this guy who calms down the offense, calms down is, is like the ultimate vocal leader and. So that, that backcourt was really fun to cover and watch this season. The dichotomy of what you're explaining there, number one, visually must be just like, you know, breathtaking and you must take a second look every single it time. Guys yes. lined up like, you know, it, it, in the jump ball circle at the start of the game. And then when you see them, I'm sure like, you know, huddling where you have like, okay, both of those guys are probably running the huddle and you have to look up for, you know, for Baldrin. <laughs> down for Jones's information. I totally get that. Uh, Alex, part of that backcourt, which was really unique, I think is one of the reasons that the Winthrop Eagles would scare a high major team or maybe another team like uh, San Diego State or Wisconsin that might slow it down and value possessions because Winthrop does like to get up and down and scores in the 80s. What do you think the Eagles do that would strike fear in a team that they would see on the other side of the bracket if March took place, why do you think a team that plays at a slower pace might be really scared to play this Eagles team in March? Like, play, put it in your crystal ball. Play fortune teller a little bit. Well, Winthrop scores a ton of points. Their primary mode of scoring, or they're, they're at their best when they're shooting a lot of threes and they're making them. And I think ultimately that is what is really scary about teams like Winthrop. You know, they do score a lot of points and. One day you get hot and you all of a sudden can't miss the three point line. Yeah, you can, you can ultimately beat any team in the country. One thing that I found, one thing that I think is quite interesting about this Winthrop team is the one, the, their biggest win of the year. It was on the road. It was the third game of the season on the road in California against nationally ranked St. Mary's winning by two, but that game was in the 60s. And so I, I think that's kind of an interesting thing. Like their biggest win was not when they were shooting particularly well. It was it was a defensive slug. I think I think that's interesting. One other final point that might get Winthrop opponents to shiver a little bit is they're not wholly one faceted. I would I would venture to say that their best player and most consistent player this season was this guy by the name of DJ Burns. DJ is a transfer from Tennessee. He grew up in Rock Hill. He went to high school at York Prep High School, got a lot of attention, got, was, was a national recruit. Roy Williams came into York Prep building. A whole bunch of ACC coaches came into the York Prep building trying to recruit this guy. Ultimately went to Tennessee, redshirted and transferred back to his home in Winthrop. And he immediately, once he got on the team, became the highest ranked recruit out of high school to, to come into Winthrop. And he's like this huge 260 pound six, six, nine forward who kind of anchors inside of the offense and it allows Winthrop to play inside out basketball. So yes, when Winthrop is playing fast and when they're hitting their threes, they're playing the best, but they do have a little bit of versatility on the offensive end. You mentioned right. that you can play a little slow. Down in St. Mary's, they obviously is one of the biggest slowdown teams, and they put the ball in Jordan Ford's hand, and, some, and hopefully he makes a play at the end of the shot clock. So that's what I was kind of angling for. Like I think even one of those slower paced teams that would be in the three hundreds via tempo uh, via Kempom, they would be scared to play Winthrop. And then if you want to get into a running match with them and shoot a whole bunch of threes, I don't think they'd be scared to do that either. I bet if Winthrop said like, "Okay, we're gonna we're gonna run this, and it's gonna be forty forty at halftime," let's do that. And then you mentioned <laughs> the key to get in that March upset is you have to have some sort of anchor inside. And you mentioned right. Byrne, who is that anchor inside? And the numbers might not jump off the page at you, but if you take a closer look, his efficiency numbers were really, really keen. And you can tell the, the effect that he had on the defensive boards and on the defensive end as like a rim deterrent, if nothing else. Oh, well, I just wanted to say that I was firstly 
the, the fact that Winthrop didn't make the NCAA tournament, I mean, obviously it was devastating, but to the athletes and to whoever they like, aspired to be at that stage. But I was also just like super curious, like were we going to see the second ever win in Winthrop men's basketball NCAA tournament history? Because this team, and I mean, again, First year covering the team, and so maybe I'm drinking some Coach Kelsey Kool Aid or something. But I would have been really interested to see how this team matched up with potentially a two seed. They were selected to, or they were projected to be a 16 seed, but maybe if some other mid major conference tournaments don't go as their plan, they sneak up into a 15 seed. And 15 versus two seeds, as we seen as of late are those are upset candidate games especially in the year of college basketball where there wasn't a saturation of really dominant teams there was a lot of parity so i would have been really interested to see winthrop in uh, the ncaa tournament but anyway no i'm just gonna say preach alex preach you are saying the exact <laughs> winthrop fans want to hear and that fans of cinderella and, and and listeners that miss march I think everybody wanted to see an opportunity for a team like Winthrop to go up against a team, you know, like we, we, we mentioned earlier that, that might slow it down. And, and, and this Winthrop team was definitely dangerous. Let's put the scout hat on for a few moments. Give us your two cents. You got to see a couple okay. of these players close up. Just, you know, just tell us the first thing that comes to your head when we talk about, uh, Carly Jones, the, the point guard for, formerly of Radford is now transferring to Louisville. What do you think of Carly Jones? He's obviously one of the best players that was in your league last season. What's, what's your two right. cents on? Jones, what, what's Louisville getting? Yeah, when I wrote the story of when Radford came to Winthrop and ultimately they were, Radford was up by 27 in the second half and Winthrop cut the game to two. Radford ended up winning by, what I wrote that after that game was Carly Jones was Radford's boy. He was Radford's royalty. Like he, he was so smooth. He plays with a sense of poise and calmness and he was the ultimate reason why he fended off went up in that 20 coming back from 27 points. I mean, he was, he was magnificent to watch. Even when the building's on fire, he was like completely calm and poised. And I'm quite excited to see what he does at Louisville next year. Coach Mack might've been watching the exact same thing that you were watching. And that's why he decided yeah. to bring him in Cardinal. Do us a favor. We talked about uh, Shibuti Phillips on the podcast earlier this season from Longwood. Just how fun was he during his career inside the Big South? He was quite fun. Uh, a lot of things have been said. About Shibuti Phillips and in that he was such a fun and um, important player to the Longwood organization when he came to Winthrop and I watched him play. I mean, those things all proved true. He was he was fast and you know Longwood's so too guy. Let's talk about you know he since you know Phillips filled the box score a ton. Let's talk about Fladanderis Fleming from Charleston Southern. He does everything. Yeah. There's nothing right. that he. Can- on a basketball court. I mean, he put up a big, uh, he put up a triple double in the Big South tournament. Give us a little feel on 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 Fleming and what he does as a basketball player all over the box court. In asking that question, you provided an answer. Yes, he is this guy who does everything. It, it was funny. So prior to the season, Big South, the Big South had its media day, and I gave a ballot to the coaches. It was a completely unofficial ballot, but I just wrote down a couple superlatives that weren't conventional best player that sort of thing or like the, the questions that i had were where's the toughest place to play in the big south other questions like that one of the questions was who's the best player in the big south that people don't know of yet and it was interesting flanders Fleming like got so many responses in that category specifically and coaches were of the consensus that flanders Fleming was that guy and i think his play kind of echoed that and Next season, people will know his name. Without question, I think that we're talking about him here. Pay attention to Fleming next year. He's going to be a stud, and he was a stud this past season. Uh, Alex, we just adore New York City guards here. How much, <laughs> how much did Gardner Webb miss the do everything guard, Jose Perez? I mean, he dropped 35 in the classic triple overtime game with your guys, Winthrop. This guy was madness, and he, I mean, he brings an unbelievable skill set. How much did they miss Jose Perez the second half of the season when he was out? I get it. I'm young. I haven't lived long enough, but that triple overtime game was the best college basketball game I've ever seen live. 
best basketball game I've ever seen live. Holy moly, big shot after big shot. It was, yeah, it was, it was, it was awesome. It was also funny. So obviously, as you said, Jose Perez was so important to this Gardner Webb team. He had an edge about him. He had a swagger about him. He talked. He was loud. He was, he would flex when he would hit big shots or and stuff like this. Right before regulation ended, he he came up to the scorer's table and like kind of scanned the crowd and untucked his jersey and said, it's over, baby. I, I had to break out one game. I, I guess he's referring to the fact that he hadn't played nearly as well as he thinks he should have in the few games prior. But he was just like, just kind of just like screaming out all this frustration that he'd had previously. And his play kind of allowed him to do that. And it was, it was like really cool to watch. And then obviously Winthrop hits like three of the craziest shots I've ever seen ever. Winthrop ultimately pulls it out. But Jose Perez had that edge and brought that swagger to that team. It's it, it, Honestly, his departure from Gardner-Webb was one of the biggest stories in the Big South. Obviously, midway through the Big South season, he... He, he left the team for undisclosed reasons, and, and ultimately Gardner Webb was able to come together after he left, and they still put together a pretty good end. But Jose Perez's impact on that team was undeniable. It was it was really cool to see. He sounds exactly like a New York City guard, by the way. If he's screaming at the oh yeah, yeah, that sounds exactly right. All right, Alex, let's play a little fortune teller here for next season. What does the 2021 season look like for Winthrop inside a vastly underrated Big South? Who's coming in and maybe who's a student athlete that will develop with further opportunity, playing time, and a year of, uh, you know, I guess, isolated development? What does the recipe hold for another ses- successful season uh, down there in Winthrop? So as I talked about earlier, Winthrop is losing Hunter Hale, the guard who could shoot the lights out, the lefty guard who could shoot the lights out. They're also losing Josh Ferguson, team's leading rebounder. They are bringing in two recruits. One is Tanari Lane, and the other is this six. And Tanari Lane is the six-five guard. They're also bringing in this guy Kelton Talford from Great Falls, South Carolina. Kelton is six-seven, super long, super bouncy, super fun to watch. Like he would collect like a dozen dunks a game. It, it seemed like and I was fortunate because as I said I do cover a lot of high school athletics and I got a chance to see Kelton so those two guys will come in and contribute right away I have no doubt in terms of the rest of the team I mean when you have a strong backcourt that is only going to get better this strong backcourt that it's really hard to kind of game plan for I mean how are you going to game plan for a six seven lefty point guard and then after him is this like super strong and quick 5-7 guard, that's already tough enough to kind of game plan for. And then you got to deal on the inside with the Big South freshman of the year, DJ Burns. I I, I really don't want to have to eat my words and come next season and say that Winthrop will will win another Big South championship. But it's hard not to um, extrapolate when you see like the pieces that already won it for him this year. That sound you're hearing, I think that's all the people in Rock Hill clapping to your prognostication for next season. <laughs> Eagles, that's what I hear right there. Clap, clap. All right, let's get you out on a fun one here. Uh, how about this, Alex? Since you had the opportunity to cover ACC hoops for a little while while you are at UNC, uh, yes. just give the listeners like, one cool, novel ACC moment that you're able to view or experience during your coverage on a local beat down there inside the iconic Hoops Conference. So, you know, share, share a little hoop story that you might have hide in your back pocket from the ACC. Oh, uh-huh. well, so, so it's funny, like UNC, being on the UNC beat is a whole different animal than being on the winter beat. You're, you're running for 10 seconds of Coach Williams is or the players' attention from a mob of from a mob of media. So I'm not sure that I have any stories that are, have been untold at this point. However, my favorite story that I can kind of recall just like off the top of my head, UNC, Duke was expected to come into the Smith Center and beat UNC, that was the, the Tar Heels that year had Joel, Theo, Luke. J- Joel and Theo were the, um, seniors though. Joel Barry, sorry, I'm, I'm talking to you like you're, uh, like you're a Tar Heel yourself. I'm sorry. Joel Barry the second and Theo Clinton, uh, were the two seniors and I, I got to cover that game for the Daily Tar Heel and that was when the press row was actually in the lower bowl of the Smith Center and when they played jump around, like, your, the, the media table was literally shaking when Theo Pinson dunked. The, he ultimately punctuated the game with 
a dunk and just screamed into the crowd. And it was like, it was the loudest I've ever seen the, or, and the loudest I've ever heard the Smith Center and the media tables were shaking again. Like I worked just as hard as I worked just as hard at documenting that dunk as I did making sure my laptop and my notebook didn't fall off the table from all the jumping season. So I, I think, I think that's my favorite. I'm, while I'm talking about it, I'm getting goosebumps. Well, I think that's exactly what the listeners are, are looking for, Alex. They're looking for their little sports fix and a little insider view on what has happened in the past, you know, with the, all these older games being on, you're kind of, Oh yeah, I don't remember that particular moment. So thank you for illustrating and framing that particular moment from the ACC for the listeners out there. All right, let's get you out of here on three fun ones. We got uh, tastes, trusts, and tunes. Alex, do you have a craft beer or a brewery that we need to know around Rock Hill, South Carolina? The best, in my opinion, the best kind of brewery sort of place in Rock Hill is this place called Legal Remedy. I love IPAs and they have troves of them. It's, however, if you're in the mood to not spend that much money. I go to the Carmella's in Fort Mill, Carmella's Pizza in Fort Mill every Tuesday night, $1 Miller High Life and $1 Natural Life if, uh, if that's more your speed. So both of those are good options. <laughs> nothing wrong with a cheap champagne of beers. Cheers to the High Life. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I think if you uh, hit up Legal Remedy, that sounds perfect too. All right. Trust, Alex. You can go in the Big South or anywhere in the nation. Who's one player this past season that you trust with a last possession on the line for the game for the win, whether it's for a make or just making a game-winning decision? One player in the nation from this past season who you trust? Oh, my goodness. This is, this is an incredibly tough question. Oh, all right, I'm going to lose. I'm going to lose all of my Tar Heel fandom credibility with this, but – the the ACC player of the year, the point guard from Duke, he just, if you did see the ending of the game, I'm sorry that I'm going to have to rehash it for you, but Tar Heels were up 10, like pretty late in the second half. They were, they were also up, they were also up two with like a couple of seconds left. Correct. Trey Jones, Trey Jones misses the first free throw. It looks like North, it looks like North Carolina is going to escape without, they tried to blunder it, but they were able to escape with a win in this oddly bad season that the Tar Heels were in. And all of a sudden, Duke's point guard just misses the free throw, collects his own rebound, scores to send it into overtime, and then hits the bucket to ultimately, to ultimately win the game in the, in, in overtime. Like that's, that's cold blooded. That's killer instinct. I think that's who I have. That's what I put my quote unquote trust in. If like I absolutely needed a bucket, but uh, Tar Heel fans, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Apologies will be accepted. I think they'll just enjoy the rehash of that particular game ending scenario. You know, we've asked this question to a number of different guests, and so far nobody said Trey Jones. That's the first Trey Jones answers that we've had this particular season. The execution of the missed free throw, and like you said, the, the gathering of the rebound, and then getting a jump shot back up before the buzzer goes off. The whole thing was crazy. And you're right. That one win for the Tar Heels, that would have been the one win that they talk about this particular season right. at like end of season dinner or award ceremony. Like, well, at least we got Duke that time. And they didn't even get <laughs> exactly. that. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And then uh, what have you been listening to? Tunes, music-wise or podcast-wise, what have you been listening to while we're longing for the return of sports, Alex? Honestly, I've been – this is going to sound peculiar as well. I honestly haven't been listening to – that much music it's always good to i'm a i'm a big hip-hop fan it's always good to listen to j cole and like his classics I, i've been waiting for him to drop something for quite a quite a long time uh, however i have been i haven't been listening to as much music or as many podcasts i am all in on the last dance which uh dropped yesterday oh my goodness what what an awesome docu series this is about to be that we're about to see. I think it's especially important for people, you know, my age who didn't necessarily live through the Jordan dominance, but only grew up hearing the the lore, awesomeness surrounding it. And so, being able to kind of live it, live through it in this docu series is really cool. So I'm really looking forward to the next couple episodes coming out on Sunday. I think yes, that. Give me a shout out. Oh, I, no, no doubt. I mean, my daughter and I, 
I've been in, engaged. She's a she's a baller. So anything that is sport, we watched the WNBA uh, draft, you know, last week. Forget about it. Um, so yeah, we were all over the last dance as well. And I think this will help add fuel to the conversation that will be never ending and probably never solved of you know who is the greatest player of all time. And, and you know, we always have that debate with LeBron and, and Michael. And maybe this will add because LeBron is still in our current view, so we're able to consume right. him in that fashion and make a real like in real time decision on how just how great he is. Whereas we have to rely on all this footage and and almost tall tales about Jordan. And now all those tall tales are gonna be coming through in the last dance. So I'm totally with you with that. And by the way, I'm just gonna shout and say, nothing wrong with a little ATM and a little Kenny Lofton from J. Cole. I'm totally down with that, Alex. That sounds great. Oh, word. You know then. All right. Yeah, yeah. All right, Alex, thank you so much for talking some hoops with us. Thanks for so thanks so much for enlightening us on Winthrop season and some of the highlights during the season and you know, taking us for a little walk down memory lane and also playing a little fortune teller. Totally appreciate it. Please stay safe, calm, and strong out there. Cheers, Sancho. Salancho, Gratulatia, Arigato. All of the above. Thank you so much for having me again.